I can I can start with the intro. So thanks again for for being with us and uh, for for joining our NetLate office hours. Uh, today the focus is going to be mostly around ML related uh, stuff. So it's our spotlight for for this um, for this this week or this NetLate office hours. And without further ado, I'll probably pass on the 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 mic to to Andy. He's going to be leading most of of this today. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um... Can everybody see my screen and hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Um, so yeah, pr probably not 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 as much to get to uh this week as we did the last week. Um main thing around the the spotlight side of things is two little sort of ML um spotlights just to keep kind of sharing some of the stuff on the ML side. Um and it's all stuff you can kind of try yourself as well and or uh, the second one is about the ML uh, demo room, so you can actually just go and play without having to kind of configure your own nodes as such. Um, and then the usual kind of questions and discussions at the end and, and uh, open open floor and feedback and all that good stuff. Um, so the two things today, the first one is the, uh, just an update on the defaults um, for the ML from the agent. So we've been, we've had ML on the agent for a long time and we've been um kind of slowly by slowly putting the pieces of the puzzle in place so first was to do ml on the on the you know the last four the most recent model the most recent four hours and then extend that training save the models to disk so we've we've kind of all the parts of the puzzle are there now that's that we've changed the defaults in the ml to be uh 24 hours by default roughly um and then the second thing the second spotlight is just an ml demo space in the in the net data demo um space that's there for anyone to play with now we've just added a new room uh just for for ml ml stuff uh which i'll go through in the second second uh, section um so really the 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 24 hours by default you, you probably won't notice it if you're not using you know any uh, custom ml config this will just kind of work um and this was in this was in one of the nightlies um a few weeks back where we we merged the pr uh, all the links and stuff are, are in here. Um, the main idea is that now out of the box, instead of using the most recent trained model, which would only get you, you know, which is only based on the last four hours of data. Um, instead now, the, the probably the simplest way to read it is to read this sentence at the bottom here, which is kind of translating all these configs uh, into English. And so what, what this is, what, what we're doing now is we're training from, uh, each model is trained on a six hour window of metrics. And um, it's trained every three hours. And when we're scoring, then we use the, the last nine models that are available. And so in normal, in the normal run of things, uh, that should cover the last 27 hours roughly. Uh, sorry, let me. So, um, so that's, that's kind of under the hood. Um, that's the new defaults for ML. And what that means basically is that um, when we say we use these number of models per dimension, what this means is that for, for anything to be considered anomalous, it has to be anomalous across all of those nine models. So for something to be flagged as anomalous, it now has a higher barrier to pass. Previously, if, it, if previously it was only the most recent model um, that was covering the last four hours, and if, if anything, if it was anomalous within that one model, it was considered anomalous, and we set the anomaly bit to one from zero. Um, and so, but now what we're doing is we're, instead of using the most recent model, we're kind of recursively checking all of those nine models. And if, unless you're anomalous on all of them, the anomaly bit would stay zero, basically. So it's like a, it's a higher barrier to pass now, um, which is kind of what we want in terms of the, the aim here is to have, to have kind of reduced false positives. Um, and, and even, even if, even if we miss a few false negatives, we want it to be, to be more strong that when, that, when we do see a jump in anomaly rates in the data, uh, it means that it's, it, it, it is more likely to be anomalous rather than kind of the opposite in terms of if you were just trying to cover everything. So this is this is 24 hours is the default, but you could actually extend this if you wanted as well. Um, and I might actually add, I might add a node into the demo space to show this, like extend it to three days or something like that. And, and you'd be able to then compare the anomaly rates. Um, and there's, there's, so there's, there's a blog post kind of discussing this. Um, there's a blog post discussing how this all works in more detail. And there's also uh, a more recent blog post as well then um, on how how the, uh, how the actual uh, anomaly detection works under the hood. So there's kind of 
some discussion about design choices. Um, discussion about two concepts. So the ma main concepts are the anomaly bit, which is the one or zero, and the anomaly rate, and then kind of some examples and 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 a few slides as well to kind of go into detail uh, to show exactly how how it all hangs together. Um, and so so in terms of in terms of this one, it's what you would the the impact would be that going from these the the old defaults to new defaults, the anomaly rate should generally be um, lower. And um, there's actually oh, I see a question there that's kind of exactly this, yeah. So so this is this is to try and this is to try and so previously something was considered anomalous if it was anomalous, and and the model only all it knew about was the last four hours, which is kind of you know that's the 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 a very minimal kind of play, starting point. Um, but obviously, you know, if, you might have different things that happen throughout throughout a whole day or a whole week. And just the last four hours isn't really enough, isn't really good enough to say like, okay, this is this is definitely anomalous because it could be something that happens, for instance, once or twice a day. And the fact that it happened in the last four hours, you, you might just get unlucky then and it might be considered anomalous when it's not. So the idea of extending the training window is to try and kind of, um, like we say, reduce the false positives and and um, increase, increase, increase the kind of true, true, true positives. So what we're looking for here is that when you do see a blip in anomaly rates or a high, an, an increase in the anomaly rate, um, it, we want it to be, you know, nine times out of 10, that, that, that there's something there. Um, once you just bear in mind that all it knows about is the last 24 hours. So obviously it's still not going to, we're still not able to kind of get things like 6 a.m. cron jobs or one, every one thing that happens once a day and stuff like that. That's kind of the next set of um, types of anomalies that we want to try and cover towards. And um, so we're kind of slowly, bit by bit, trying to extend the the sort of Venn diagram of the type of anomalies that we cover. Um, and um, that's the pros and that's mainly the pros and the main pros and cons. And um, the, the, one of the the only cons was we had to be very careful about the implementation so that we don't kind of burn through CPU or burn through overhead on the agent uh, with these bigger models, you know. So that's why we've done it in this um, in this approach where we use. We use like a set of model, a set of small models that collectively together cover the 24 hours, rather than sort of trying to train one big giant model. Because when we tried to do that retrain on full 24 hours, that would be too noticeable on the agent. So there's kind of a few little design choices in there as well, um, which are discussed a little bit in the blogs as well, um, in more detail. Um, well, and, optimize, Andy, what you're saying is use more like the the number of models you want to have like in this case, to nine. So if you want to increase a bit more, you could increase the number of models instead of extending the, the training window lengths because of what you said, yeah. not have very big windows to be retrained when the, the it needs to, to happen, yeah. Yeah, and there's, a, there's actually, there's a PR here that has some some um, discussion and examples of showing the impact of the anomaly rates. Um, like there's a there's nodes in here that have, um, you know, ones that have the old defaults and ones with the new defaults. And generally, the the main takeaway is basically that uh, anomaly rates everywhere are kind of lower, but they still react when you do have a true anomaly. So, and, Andy, I think there's a question on, you know, what is the downside if the training window is made even even longer, um, or why wouldn't we make it even longer than 24 hours? Make it a week, for example. Yeah. Um. No, so that's that. That's something that actually we could do, and I, I, I'm probably going to try and do in the in the ML demo space. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a node that, like all the nodes in there at the moment, are 24 hours the default. But I might make a node in there that that extends that to maybe 72 hours, and then we you'd actually be able to see the impact uh, because there's a there's a custom dashboard around the anomaly detection diagnostics that shows the overhead of the ML. And you would be able to actually compare the two. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I don't think there's any real reason, uh, unless you have, you know, tens of thousands of dimensions, then you might have to think about it. But nine I, I times think, out of 10, I think it would be fine, you know? Yeah, I agree. And to answer Louis's question, I think we're just being really careful here. Uh, we want to be really you know, mindful of the resource usage when we, when we play around with uh, the ML default parameters. So we do intend, you know, if everything is okay to increase it further. Because you know, even though it's more than twenty four hours now, there's still a few corner cases sometimes where we could kind of uh, like weekend scenarios or you know Monday to Sunday, <laughs> things like that, where uh, you know we we might not have enough to detect whether it's a real anomaly or not. Uh, so increasing the window further might help there. Increasing the window to include time of day, time of, you know day of week sort of scenarios might help. Uh, we we are kind of experimenting with this, 
and as you know as as long as we're convinced that the resource utilization on the agents would not be a problem then yeah we might be increasing it further yeah so the, the key and there problem was a, the last question there from us was um about the streaming config as well so um in in the streaming config, if you don't do anything, it'll happen on both. Um, so, but obviously, if you want to, you can just run it only on the parent. So there's a, there's some examples of that in the um, in the ML docs, some like various topologies of configs. Um, so it, we it doesn't it, we're not trying to be too fancy and try and detect if a child is streaming and then turn the ML off. We had discussed that, and we might sort of think about that at some stage. But um, for now, if you were to have a child with ML and stream that to a parent, the ML would happen on both, which is actually okay because that just sort of becomes like a, an averaging of the two is the way it, NetData Cloud treats it. So it's, it's kind of almost more robust that way. Um, but you could obviously then turn it off on the child if you wanted and just have it only on the parent. And whenever NetData, whenever NetData Cloud is trying to look for anomaly rates, it'll route towards the parent um, as first preference. Guys, um, yeah, exactly. So, like having a big parent is is something for sure. Um, sort of like what Shan was talking. We there's a whole set of more more expensive models we could try and do, but obviously then you would have to say, well, these kind of fancy V two models they should only really happen on a parent versus a child. And so we might, you know, when we do graduate to a different type of model that can can have uh, bigger windows and more features like time of day and and even other. Uh, metrics from other uh, other metrics, then you know it, we could one way to do that could be to say, okay, these these we advise you to run these on a parent and um, this more advanced ML uh, as opposed to a child. But we're trying to we're trying to actually start with kind of as broad a coverage as possible of like generally useful, um, and then narrow down from there. So so yeah, these are all kind of exactly the sort of um, design and discussions and trade offs we're trying to trying to make. Um, so that's that one. That's kind of, you know, you wouldn't really notice it, but it, it's kind of, that's what it's, that's what's going on under the hood. Um, and then the, the second ML spotlight here is around the demo space. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, wait a so, minute before, before um, we, go. we have in the, in the net data demo, uh, space, there's now I'm machine sure. learning. I think also is trying to say something. Sure. I don't know if you can, if you can hear me. me. I, I thought oh, sorry. I have a problem with my microphone. Oh, we, we, we can no, hear you. <laughs> You're on mute now. Sorry. So for people to understand, and this is very important, guys, we're trying to minimize the overhead of a match. Costa, I think you can unmute yourself and speak. No, we, we, we can hear you, Costa. I don't know. Maybe all of us cannot. <laughs> no, I unmuted you. you, you. Uh, I don't hear Costa right now. I heard him. Ah, OK. Yeah, okay. So you, you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think most of the people can hear. Yeah, go ahead, Costa. So the, the key problems that we are trying to prevent here, to 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 optimize here, is actually to have uh, um, optimal performance of the agent. If we are about to query one day of data for on every training, that's a lot of data points to be queried um, uh, for a training. Eh? So this is what we are trying to avoid. If the agent is overwhelmed with a ton of millions of points per second to be queried by ML, then the capacity of the query, the query capacity of the agent is uh, is um, uh, minimized. Eh? So you are not going to have enough of, enough of capacity to actually do other stuff. So that's one thing. This is why the incremental uh, uh, training is important, not to train a day but at once, but train. Uh, a model every few hours. The second problem is that how many models, the number of models that you can have there, um, affects the memory footprint of the agent. So if you have a very big parent with millions of metrics, because we train a model for every point, for every metric, eh? so with millions of metrics, then every model needs about uh, 100, 150 bytes in memory. Now, we are trying to minimize that. So this is an attempt to actually say, OK, we train a keep up to nine models per metric. That's a lot of memory if you have a, a highly a highly scalable, a, high, a, a lot of metrics in one parent. That's really a lot of memory there. So the next, I think, step is to actually load and save models depending on various scenarios. For example, I think that it would be better to have 
we need to test it, of course, but it, it, it may be better to have to train a model for, I don't know, uh, Wednesdays uh, from uh, 10 to 11 o'clock. And you have, I don't know, a few models to cover that area eh? for a few hours, but name day. So the previous week, the two weeks ago, etc., etc. So that you know what happens on Wednesdays from that time to that time. Uh, this requires a little bit more work there, mainly because we, we need to load and save models. Eh? We, we cannot afford to keep everything in memory. We need to load and save models as time passes. But I think this is where it, it will stabilize at the end. So the biggest problem currently, we have 24 hours. Now, you have to understand also that we need at some point to forget the, the trainings. Why we need to forget? Because this is unsupervised ML. So you don't configure anything. You don't, you don't say, hey, this is an anomaly. This is truly an anomaly, or this is not an anomaly. This is a false positive. You don't say that, and the models do not know your feedback. So it, they have to forget, otherwise an anomaly that will happen today will become the normal pattern from, the, from now on. So it is important to forget. Um, it, it's not reasonable to say, for example, that we're going to train staff and we will have for months or years. I think the biggest problem is to understand the days. This is the most important thing currently. So to, to know that on Mondays the pattern is like this or on nights we have backups in the likes so of the pattern is like this. And then we need to figure out how we're going to solve the Black Friday problem. That's a completely different problem. Eh? That suddenly one Friday is completely different from all the others. But I think this is a progressive thing. Eh? We are doing minimal changes without affecting much of CPU and memory footprint to actually bring the best result. Sorry, guys, this is what I wanted to say. Yep, and um, that's so. For anyone curious, we're we're looking at sort of. I put in the I put in the chat um, a link if you want to read more about like the next type of model we might look at that could control for these sort of things. That it's more. It would be uh, like an isolation forest or this fancy variants of it and one thing one last thing to say actually about the defaults is actually um the overall impact of these new defaults lowered the the, the overhead of the ml on the agent it turned out because uh, previously we were training every one hour which is a bit silly you don't need to read you know the world doesn't change drastically every one hour and so now we're only training every three hours which is fine because you know you, you probably don't want to train every hour because that might be too too update too quick so that means you're just doing less training throughout the whole day. And then the impact of actually moving from a four hour window to a six hour window, that was practically negligible because we sample, we don't obviously, we, we kind of do tricks and stuff where we sample randomly within that window. And um, so overall, the impact of this actually reduced, funny enough, the impact uh, of the of the ML, which is nice. And we'll get to that in the next, there's, um, there's a, in the, that kind of brings me on to the next, the demo space, there's actually a dashboard in the ML demo space that's called uh, Anomaly Detection Diagnostics, where you can look at all the different kind of diagnostic charts we look at for to see the impact of the ML on the agent. Um, and you can kind of then play around with it yourself. Um, so I'll just, any, any questions now? I think we're okay. So, um, yeah, so the ML demo space kind of, so it, it's related to a lot of this. Um, this is... The main thing here is there is, uh, I'll just jump in and sh kind of show you because this is in the public, um, in the NetData demo space. There's now, there's all these kind of demo rooms and there's now a machine learning room in here. And um, the machine learning room has these three nodes, kind of one, one nightly, one stable, and one, uh, I think this is also nightly. And um, each of these nodes are running, you know, they have, they have the default ML config, um, but then they also have various, uh, there's various users in here that are kind of running stuff. So there's like, you can see there's, there's, a, net, there's a user called network guy, there's a guy called file stressor, IO user, CPU hog. These are all kind of bad users who are running, running constant workloads using um, stress NG and various tools like that and cron jobs. And then there's this kind of random bad guy who every day, once a day, wakes up and does something terrible. Um, and so these are kind of, there's, these aren't just like, normal typical demo nodes where nothing's happening. There's kind of steady constant workloads and then there's also kind of random stuff happening here as well. Um and so what we have in here does I've I've created a couple of dashboards as well just to to show. So um there's like an anomaly detection dashboard here which is is basically just the 
the the charts from the anomaly detection uh, section in the menu here uh, down here but it's just a little bit more uh, focused version of it so there's there's like your top binode anomaly rate here so you can see okay you can kind of quickly come in and see okay these all you know the the ml demo uh, node went up to about 1.8 node anomaly rate um in the last sometime in the last 15 minutes so i wonder what that is um and you can see like this is the number of normal dimensions so conversely when this drops you would see the increase in the anomaly rate and then there's um we do have this detector events here as well so there's uh there's default logic in the ml that says if this anomaly rate goes past a certain threshold and stays higher long enough then we would trigger an event um in here which i don't think there's it didn't stay high, high enough here but there's probably some from earlier if i if I go back far enough, there'll be, and you shouldn't see that many of these, but like here's one. Um, and these are these are config kind of parameters. So you can see here um, on the ML demo node, we had an, it went above the threshold for this window of time, which was, you know, what I don't, what, what's that? Uh, I can never find one minute, about one minute. So you can see that this green line, it went, it went so high that on average, then it went over the threshold. And at, at this point in time, it kicked in and that's, an event. So if you if you didn't really want to look at the anomaly rates, because sometimes the anomaly rates are a bit tricky to to reason about, they can be too granular. Um, you could just look at these anomaly events, and I think it's it's basically if if the anomaly rate goes over one percent for a long enough window, basically is what the default is. There the defaults are in the um in the in the docs. I, I think it's one percent for for a, a kind of two two minutes or something like that. Um, so this is and then there's also there's also a dashboard in here about the diagnostics. So this is more about sort of what's the overhead of the ML. So when we're, when we're looking at, um, as you know, when we're, if we're making changes to ML configs or if we're working on different feature branches for the ML, these are the sorts of charts we'd be looking at in terms of, well, what's the overall CPU, CPU uh, usage of net data itself? And uh, what's the usage in terms of memory? And then also then there's, there's really specific worker um, kind of worker specific threads here for there's there's two main parts of the ml there's the ml training and then there's the ml detection and they're kind of split out separately to to account for you know the impact of the training and then the impact of the the detection every second every second when it's doing that scoring job um and so if you what you would see is if i look at like the last 12 hours here um you would see that basically um this here is the ML train. So every 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 couple of hours, it 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 comes and it spreads the training out over the train window. So you can see this is like the impact of the training, and then you can see next here is the ML detection. So this is like a steady the steady impact of the um of the actual scoring every second of all the of all the dimensions. And then there's more there's kind of more various ways to dig into this of um basically different type, different different diagnostic metrics like how many models are consulted so in this in this case um this kind of measures like what costa was saying if you have 5000 dimensions you you might have 4000 models here because it, obviously we, we don't train for like constant dimensions we don't train a model on because it doesn't make sense but generally for every every dimension there should be pretty much a, a model unless you've configured cer certain ex exclusion patterns and so what we can see here is like there's about 1100 models uh scored every second so about 1100 dimensions each of them has has a model and that gets scored um and various kind of so these are just various detailed charts which to be honest some of them are quite kind of some of them are um internal and um not enabled by default so there's an extra parameter you have for enabled statistics charts for in the ml section um but if you know just just feel free to reach out to us if you're if you're looking around at any of this stuff and want to chat more about it um the, Actually, the other thing about... a question on the yep. thread by, by Louis. Um, it, it was curious if the ML accounts for its own processing uh, uh, time to to not consider to be the anomaly rate. So if you have anomaly the anomaly workers and the threads uh, causing some some load, uh, will this be kind of uh, negated from the from the calculation? yeah? The short answer is yes. Um, and uh but the the more nuanced answer is yes but we've also kind of we've also kind of hacked it a little bit so so there's um we do exclude there's um there's a parameter in here which is charts to skip from trains charts to skip 
And so we exclude any of the charts that start with net data, we exclude. So because we, we just don't want them to kind of get in and mess things up. Um, they shouldn't really, you know, and you could turn this off and you could put them back in if you wanted to, but um, we generally, they, they, sh they shouldn't. Um, but it can happen sometimes. Like if you go in and if you change, make a net data config change and then restart net data and then net data has side effects on other metrics, then for sure you might see some, um, you might see some impacts and stuff, but that's, that's okay. Cause that's then like a valid anomaly. So it's, it, it gets a little bit sort of, there's a, a trade off sometimes. Um, but yeah, good, good question. And so, cause if you wanted to, if you wanted to only turn ML on for only your apps, you know, charts or only your Postgres dimensions, or you could do that all in here as well. So you don't have to have it on for everything. You can, you can only turn it on for, you can turn it on for whatever you want, kind of, uh, and pick and choose. Um, the other thing about the, the ML demo room was to go over. So this is something that we haven't done yet that people have asked for, um, which is ML alerts. So in the, um, but there's a couple on the screen here, but there's a, what we haven't done yet is we haven't enabled any ML alerts by default. Um, and this demo, the demo space here does turn on some ML alerts. So what, what, as far as we've got at the moment is in, in the health that ships with net data, we have this um, ML conf, uh, which is just everything commented out. And so we're kind of working towards now that we have the new defaults that cover the last 24 hours, we're, we're sort of dog fooding these new defaults. And eventually we want to get to the point where we're comfortable to add some uh, out of the box ML alerts in here. Um, so at the moment you can see some examples with sort of comments and stuff, but they're all commented out. So they, they, none of these are on by default. Um, but what we've done in the, in the demo room is um, in here, in the demo room, you'll be able to see there's, there's alert configurations here where um, anything, any of the ML alerts all start with this ML underscore. So like the, the, the first obvious one here is, um, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, gist, uh, a gist with all of this as well, but basically this one here is the, the one minute node level anomaly rate. And so it sort of said, what, it, what this is running is, this is just like a traditional alarm, but it's a traditional alarm on the node anomaly rate. And so that's how it's gonna denote anomaly rate. So there's, there's three ver there's kind of three ways to do this. So there's the first one here, um, and I'll, I'll put the I'll put this actually in. There's a there's a there's a guest here. I'll put that in. You can see this has all the ones that are running on the. These are all the alerts running on the demo nodes basically. But if you look at the slide, the first one here is the node level anomaly rate. So this is just a normal um a normal alert. On the anomaly on the anomaly rate chart itself, so there's no nothing kind of fancy there. It's just because we have that anomaly rate line in the anomaly detection section. Of course, you can just set an alert on that, and that 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 then becomes just a, an overall node anomaly rate alert. Um, but where it probably gets more interesting then is in the second two, which is if you want, you can set an alert at the chart level based on the anomaly rate, um, or you can set it at individual dimensions. So the like the first example here, I'm not sure if you can see it super clear, but this is like system CPU chart. Uh, this is basically a, a five minute, you know, rolling five minute anomaly rate on the system CPU chart. And so the only difference between this um, and a normal sort of alert is that we have this anomaly bit option in here. So what this is saying, the look up here is saying that we're averaging over the last five minutes uh, of passing through the options anomaly bit of everything in this chart, all the dimensions. And this, the options anomaly bit means that instead of working on the raw metrics like you would usually work, you're now working on those ones and zeros, which are the anomaly bits, which is basically the anomaly rates. So, so what we're saying here then is we're saying like, okay, if the, if the, if the rolling five minute uh, anomaly rate for the system CPU chart goes over 1%, then we make a warning. And if it goes over 5%, we make a critical. And obviously these, these are just like example thresholds. You would probably need to tinker with the thresholds a little bit yourself. Um, and then the last kind of way, way to do this is at the dimension level. So net data doesn't ship with, um, as a, for apps, apps.cpu, for instance, we don't actually have default alerts based on the apps because we can't really pre-configure a rule ahead of time for each app because sure, how would we know? So one potential solution to that would be, um, something like this third option here, which is where we're doing the same thing, like a, a five minute rolling window, uh, on the app CPU but for each dimension. 
<clears throat> so here what we're doing is we're, we're doing the same thing, but instead of across all dimensions, we're using this for each. And the for each then will we'll actually just do it for each dimension. You would, you would have an, uh, an alert for each dimension. And so this means that if, if the anomaly rate um, changes for each individual dimension and, and he, he hits these thresholds, then it'll trigger an alert. So this is one way where we could maybe have like a data-driven alert for, for things like apps or users that you couldn't, you know, how NetData wouldn't really be able to ship with any of these pre-configured alerts out of the box in the old way of doing things, but maybe with some ML alerts, um, it could be useful, you know? So, and there's, so there's examples here in, I'll show you what I mean in the demo space. Um, to, to, to sort of make all this obvious, uh, I've enabled the alarms collector in here. So there's a Python alarms collector that just gets the value um, of, of all the alarms each, each few seconds. And so I've, I've put that here so you can see kind of exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, in the alarms collector, you have two charts. One is the status and one is the value. But what this lets you do is it lets you just see the value over time. Um, and I've just for the ML alert. So like the, if, what, what I can see here is, for instance, um, if I look at the top one here, I see app CPU, dim, SSH. So if I just filter to kind of clean this out, uh, it, this, is this, this is basically saying, there was, a, there was an increase in the anomaly rate for this SSH dimension on the app's CPU chart. And I'll, I'll just do this by node because I'm not sure, exactly, I don't actually know which node this is here. So, because it's the tree node, so the red one here. So this is the ML demo node. So if I highlight this, if, if I wanted to, like I could have an alert, I'm not sure if this actually triggered, I think this did trigger an alert, but yes. There's a, there's a few SSH. You can see there's the memory SSH, threads SSH. So something, something went on with SSH here, uh, which I think was probably me earlier on. Yeah, so you can see here that it, it went to status one, which is warning. And, and that makes sense because it only went up to um, 1%. I think this 100 is, is 1%. So what this is saying, like this is just an easy way to say, this is kind of just for sense checking the alerts that they're doing what they're supposed to do. But if I look now and look at the uh, apps, uh, CPU for, for the SSH, um, I should see some sort of anomaly. Uh, and in this case, it's just a little spike. Um, let me do this line here. So here we can see when we zoom in, particularly here actually is where it started. So it's a kind of, and this is one thing about the anomaly rates, as you zoom in, it sort of becomes clearer because as, you, as, as you're zoomed out at higher windows, the, the anomaly ribbon, it, it kind of has to get a little bit more compressed. So sometimes it's not until you kind of zoom in here that you could really see uh, what's going on. Um, and the, that's kind of the whole point because you wouldn't really see this with your eyeballs looking at this when we started off. You wouldn't, especially with the apps charts because there's so much stuff on them, you wouldn't actually pick this out with the human eye. Um, you would only kind of get it through something like a rule. Um, and so if we, if we look here, it was the ML demo node. So let's just filter for that node. Uh, with this guy here. And what we can see here is that actually what this is saying is um, at, so, there, at someone SSH'd on and that then triggered a change. And then it takes a, it takes a, a few seconds for um, the changes to impact the anomaly rate. And that's then triggered this, this alert here, basically. Um, and so th this is just saying, if you, so if you wanted to, you could have, you know, there, there would have been a trigger to say SSH dimension on apps.cpu went into warning based on the anomaly. Um, and this is just kind of an example. I'm not sure exactly how practical or useful this one is, um, but that's, to, that's kind of just to, to, show, to show you kind of how it works. And like, so if you were curious and starting some, and playing around with some of these ML alerts, um, you could kind of use in here as like a guide. And there's, there's all the different flavors are here. There's the dimension level ones, there's the chart level ones, and then there's the overall node ones as well. So, um, that you can kind of use that as a guide to kind of set one or two up your on your own uh, infrastructure and and see if they're useful or see if you know see if they're not. Um, I love to get any feedback if if anyone is interested in doing this because um, if the the only way to get all this you know the best thing for all this is to get feedback from the community because we can we can only do a certain you can do so much dog food in ourselves but the whole all the different types of infrastructure types of workloads there's no way for us to really properly dog food all fully ourselves so um the best is to actually kind of get it out to the community in a way that people can use it and play with it and and help us kind of improve it and add feedback um so yeah so like hopefully this ml room in here is like a first 
uh, first place to go and look at stuff like this. Um, but then you can also then use this to sort of set up your own configurations if you want. Um, and th yeah, that's pretty much it. There's, I, I won't go on too much. There's, you know, there's um, every day there should be some anomalies in here every, um, randomly. So, um, you know, see if you can find some basically. Um, yeah, I think I, got, I think I went on a bit long there anyway. So uh, any questions? Yeah, that's actually one one comment from Lewis about the um, the clicking. In, in your case, since you know what's happening on this room, you are kind of navigating through the through the through the information, through the alerts, and through the through the charts. I think one point that uh, we have to try to facilitate uh, these to the users and to surface to these to the users is also with the AHR percentage button on top of the table of content that we try to already give a hint to the user. Try to find across uh, this time frame highlighted or the daytime picker time frame where there's potential things for me to look at. Uh, that is kind of a, a guide to tell you where to try to start looking at. Of course, we want to give, yeah. give him some more insights, but I think that's kind of a starting point, right? To try to understand where you need to go and, and try to see what's happening. Yeah, that's a good point because there's there's kind of two there's two main ways to think about this and approach this. And this is some exactly discussions we've been having with our own SREs internally as well. Um, there's like there's top down anomaly detection and there's bottom up anomaly detection. And so so like bottom up is is basically what this this ribbon is here to serve. So if you're looking at, you know, if I'm in here looking at this user chart and I see, oh, I see a little blip for Andrew M here. So I might say, you know, I'm, this is bottom up now. I'm in the moment and I see, oh, look, there's a spike from Andrew M, you know, the user. What's this now? What's going on? And now I can find, you know, maybe you care, you don't care. Um, and this is like, this is, you've started at the bottom at some in some particular dimension. Maybe you got here from alert, some idea, who knows? But then there's the other approach, which is the top down, which is to say, okay, just let me, let me look at a high level and see if there's anything strange going on. And that's the main kind of aim of the anomalies tab is to facilitate that. So in, in the anomalies tab, for instance, um, I can come in here and look at the last, you know, 12 hours or whatever. And I can see there's a there's a spike here um, for this on this uh, ML demo stable node. So I might say like, oh, what's this this little blue bit blip here? What is that? I'm curious. And so I can sort of drill in. I'm not sure. Yeah, this is this might be might be valid. It went, so this is saying basically um, within this window, the anomaly rate went up to about 3% for a couple of minutes. And so I can highlight this area. And then the question is, well, what, what, what was driving that increase in the node anomaly rate? And then that's where you can see um, these are, you know, this is, these are dimensions actually driving it. Um, some, this, you know, some file system stuff going on here. Um, sometimes you might see specific apps or specific users. Um, so this is like the top down approach that we're trying to do with the anomalies tab. And then the, the bottom up approach is kind of within your normal workflows in that, in that data, we want to kind of just add these ways where you can use things like the anomaly rate to augment your, your, your typical workflows. But yeah, there's definitely, um, there's definitely a bit of an act to it. And it's not sort of, there's no sort of show me the answer button just yet. It is still a bit like, it's just another tool like any others that you have to do, have to learn a little bit to, to see, okay, when do you trust it? When don't you trust it? When will it be useful? When won't it? And so, yeah, for sure. There's a, there's a little bit of, um, kind of, getting used to it as well. Well, thanks. Thanks for adding that, Andy. Let's see, I think Louis is still writing something, but we are also on the open question. So if anybody wants to, to, to unmute and, uh, and ask or share on the chat, we can, we can see. Yeah, the fine uh -huh. RSRs are looking for that fine, fine problem button as well. So. <laughs> You're not the only one. So there, there, there is an experiment that we are doing, you know, with a chat GPT plugin where you can actually say the questions you want, like find problems. Eh? Do I have any problems? And this goes through the scoring engine, gives everything to chat GPT, and then chat GPT makes a verdict. Hey, you know what? Your this guy or that node is too high, or your application, this application is crashing, or you have out of memory kills somewhere. Uh, but this needs a little bit more experimentation, I think. Uh, the, the idea, however, this was it. Eh, to, because the data has a scoring engine inside it. Uh, so unlike the other any other monitoring solution that they just present you metrics, 
we have invested heavily in actually scoring all the metrics eh, according to some patterns or whatever you want there. And we can find across a time frame that something is interesting uh, that could potentially lead to issues, etc. So um, I think we need a little bit more work there. But uh, yeah, I, I, like, I love this button too. Eh? Do I have a problem? What is it? Even what do you think about my current status? The current yeah. status of my infrastructure. <laughs> this is something that we've, we've actually had a few discussions internally about that NetData, once you install it on your system, it already kind of learns a bunch of stuff about it. You know, it can it can figure out based on the pre-configured alerts if certain thresholds are being hit. So, you know, in theory, we should be able to give you like a report, right? Like here's all the problems in your infrastructure. Uh, but, you know, in practice, it's a bit more trickier to do it. But, yeah, that's where we eventually want to get. Yeah, and it's, it, it definitely is possible. But it's, um, I think it's, there's a, there's an example here where we actually, we tell it to look at the app CPU chart for, for these dimensions. And, and you just don't, even if you just do the dumbest thing possible, which is literally just throw the data at it, and you tell it, give it a, give it a sort of a sensible prompt and tell it what the, give it the data and then just ask it, um in this in this case we gave it a baseline and a highlight and said you know is there anything anything different there and it it did actually pick out like it, it basically came back and said everything seems fine but there is there is a decrease of um you know the sql um that might need investigation and if you look you can actually see i, I should have plotted this but there there actually is you see this drop here in sql it literally picked out you know it did actually pick out the, the drop so and this is like the this is the, the the most naive way you could possibly do this, but to do it properly, this it's yeah, these proof of concepts are one thing, but making a proper kind of product out of it is a whole whole different yeah. ball game. But definitely something to it, you know. Yeah. So we we're gonna be doing this in in you know in baby steps. The first step is gonna be uh, just helping with alert troubleshooting. So if you see a bunch of alerts on your infrastructure, you want to make sense of it. You know, is it really critical? What do you need to do about it? Where do you need to go look uh, to kind of make sense of the alert? Uh, so that's something that you know we will be adding soon. It's it's a feature that's currently in testing. Um, you know, if anybody's interested in uh, beta testing it, uh, you know, please ping us on Discord. We can yeah. you know, yeah. hook you up. <laughs> can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Cool. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Now I need more caffeine. Um, yeah, because this is really good. Because when stuff falls over. Is is kind of easy to troubleshoot in a way. It's like the easiest scenario. It's when stuff is not broken, but it's not quite working. That's the stuff that really kills you. You know, like you've got a, a WAN link and it's not quite right because your MTUs aren't uh, aren't matching up. So you're getting some fragmentation some of the time, but not all of the time. Um, you know, this is stuff that makes you want to put a bullet in your head. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. Cool. And I think this, yeah, this is where the anomaly advisor is critical because on the anomaly advisor you can go there, see if there is a trend about anomalies, and figure out what is the thing that triggers this anomaly. This is was the intention. Eh? So you don't need to assume. Oh, let's assume. Let's speculate. It may be the database. It may be the storage. It may be the network. The anomaly advisor. The good thing with the anomaly advisor, you go there, you highlight an area. And it tells you which uh, metrics are the most relevant ones in that time frame. So your aha moment is probably, you see here, uh, this is uh, close FD and uh, do is open, this is are from eBPF. But if you scroll down a bit, you will see that it is, even this RCU, you will see, for example, that somewhere is a user. Where is the user? Uh, yeah, Adi. Yeah, you can see it here. It's actually my user. Yeah, a user did it. If you go a little bit below, you will find, for example, that there are issues about some sockets and stuff. Of course, these are tiny now because the, 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 the spike is not important, that important. But here you see a sorted list of all metrics that somehow, out of the thousands of metrics that you have, it is a sorted list of metrics that are relevant. Something changed on them during that period. Uh, and they had anomaly rates, eh? increased anomaly rates. I think this is this is important if you are looking for that thing that you are discussing, uh, Luis. 
Can you and can you can you sort them by anomaly rate in that view? They are. Uh, oh, they, they are. They are. Good. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, what I thought. But this is. Yeah, I think I think we're, there's usually pills here. Um, the pills aren't quite there at the moment, but there's there's usually pills that tell you the anomaly right here. This is yeah, um, I've seen that. But yeah, that's exactly. But th one thing I definitely want to do here is to bring more understanding. So I think we're getting close at like understanding a strange looking pattern and saying over to you. We don't know anything about it, but we definitely could do more to help you as a user then understand like, OK, well, what does this all represent? Like this collection of dimensions with these types of anomalies, is there any way we can say, like, like take this a step up into more of a semantic understanding, like what you're actually looking for? That's yeah. one thing I'd love to try and do a bit more here. Um, but it's a, it's a tricky one, but it's definitely something I think we can we could have a stab at, you know, if we could have uh, you, and usually how people do this is you have to like layer on your topology on top of your metrics and then they might say, oh, this is, you know, app A and they give you this nice graph and stuff. So we don't really have any of that, but it would be nice to try and bring some more high level stuff on here as well. So, yeah, I totally agree. Great. Uh, any other questions? I have a non ML one if no one else has a question. Go ahead, Luis. Yep. Um, and it kind of jumps straight off for what you said about topology. Because as far as I can tell, what we don't have now is kind of a conception of, um, you know, you can group things into what into spaces and things like that, nodes and what whatever. But, um, you know, if I, I'll give you an example, say at the moment, I'm doing a lot of HTTP and network ping checks, but um, I kind of want to group them together so that I can understand when one is, you know, if, if I'm just falling over from one site, rather than say from another site and then i know it's that site is the problem so um it, for example in the i'm trying to think of sorry my brain's gone to mush but the idea is you know how do you get the 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 it i have i need to get more sleep but it's the idea of how do you group things together so that you're kind of showing dependency right So I think, um, uh, let me understand this, when you have, uh, let's assume that all your infrastructure is in the same space. So if it is in the same space, you have rooms to actually group them as you wish. And the idea, the initial idea was that you should be able to uh, create rooms at will. So you have the old nodes room that has all your infrastructure, so you can see the correlation across everything. But this, if this is very noisy, then you can create a room with just the infrastructure you you want. So there is no limit, for example, to put some infrastructure in one room only. You can put each component or each server on as many rooms as you wish. So if you want to uh, correlate, for example, service A and service B, just create a room, put them there, both, and boom, you have the, the unified view about service A and B together. Is this what you are looking for? Uh, no, but I can't remember how to explain it. I'm having a uh, think a stroke. Uh, I'll post it later on when my brain has resumed functioning. Uh, okay. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. I, I think I, I have, I, I think I might have a similar kind of idea and has come up in the past, which is like, if I only want, if you, if you just wanted to say, you should be able to just get an, an anomaly rate for the subset of your metrics, which is all those HTTP checks or any, any combination of them you want. So we have been thinking about this notion of like a virtual metric or a derived metric, which could be um, just starting like purely from my own point of view, say I wanted to have an anomaly rate per user. Like why wouldn't I be able to have that? An anomaly rate per app. So across all of the dimensions that are, are related to this app, I want one anomaly rate, um, which has come, a few people have asked for it. It's come up with a different view, which is having saved views, like a view of your space or your room which kind of is like a subset of you is like a subset of interest. You say this, this is this bag of metrics and this is all, you know, app A, this is app B, or, you know, you just give them some group and then you can save that as a view. And in that view, you can have all of your, 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 your group boys, your, all your custom, you know, have pre-done all your clicking for you and stuff as well. Um, 
so like that's come up in the past as well. And I think there's definitely something we could do there because if you could say, okay, all this this subset of metrics, this relates to my database. This is my front end. And if if we could then take that and say, okay, okay, that's database, that's front end. We could say if we have even if we have alerts or even, but obviously just from my own point of view, if we were to say, okay, there's an elevation in anomaly rates in this set of metrics, and then there is an elevation in this set of metrics, and then there is also one in this set, you could eventually get to that sort of graph where you can see, you know, the, the typical graph view that people use where they can see, oh, it started in the database and then it went into the app and then it went into, you know, um, and so like something like that is something that I think could be useful that we have been thinking about as well, which, you know, might be sort sort of, if we could do that in a general way where it's not just about ML, then that could be useful. Do you guys intend to do any, um, you know, networking type stuff? Because right now it's like SNMP and or go home. This has come up in the past as well, for sure. Um, we we have talked about it. Because like right now, say I know uh, that I'm, you know, like I monitor stuff from on the same site. I do it from multiple um, cloud sites, right? But um, aside from, you know, ping it's up or down, yeah, how I, I can't really get any insight into the network or not much aside from just round trip time and things like that. And I can't piece it together, right? Because it net data doesn't know what route the traffic is taking. Yeah, I think we've talked about that in the past. I know, Cost, do you have an idea? Because it, it, it would be big, a big enough kind of data model change, but we had thought about it as like this network visualizer. And there could be some stuff around, like maybe some of the function stuff could could end up being useful there as well. But I don't know, Cost, you can take this one. So, so you are interested mainly about flow, traffic flows. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Uh... Okay, we can. Um, the, the problem with this is the following: the data has keeps track of a time series per something. Now, for traffic flows, I think it's a little bit more. It's a little bit different. What the, what the software that analyzes flows should usually do is that they grab you know snapshot of the traffic from some time, uh, and then they analyze that thing. So the entire thing that the entire data set that, we, that they have is whatever the, the traffic uh, aggregated is, the, tra the traffic captured is. Uh, in our setup, uh, we, have, um, we have discussed to capture traffic mainly from uh, eBPF and actually make an analysis to find the dependencies across uh, components. So to know, for example, that this server and that server communicate and uh, they use, I don't know, this socket or the, one is the DNS server, the other is the DNS client or um, this is a web server and this is a web client. So we, we can do this kind of stuff, but then the whole point is what do you actually and how do, do we should actually keep track of that over time? Because that's the most tricky part. If we turn every socket into a time series, wow, that's a lot of time series out there. If you are talking about, I don't know, a busy mail server or a busy web server, that's a ton of, uh, of sockets out there. Uh, so probably we need to, uh, currently what we do is that we aggregate stuff. So we say, okay, look at this. Um, uh, all this, even though they are for the applications, this, this is why we have apps, apps, uh, apps plugin eh, that groups process together. Because if we were tracking them per PID, the cardinality of the database explodes. And this makes things unmanageable, totally unmanageable. So uh, I'm not sure how to do it for flows, for traffic flows. Um, uh, we have in our roadmap to actually find a solution to have a dependency map for all your servers. So to actually build something that will say, you know what? This server depends on that server for a database. It talks Postgres or MySQL or something, or it depends on that thing for DNS, depends on that thing for storage. So we have this in our roadmap, but um, I'm not sure that we will be able to keep track of all the time series, of all the different flows across the past. Probably we're gonna identify the dependencies and just take the dependencies as granted. Um, 
So uh, this is a, this is a, you understand that this is a technical problem. If we have an infinite number of time series, then the database becomes unmanageable. That's the problem. So we need to to shrink the possible the cardinality of the metrics into a finite set. It cannot be infinite. Yeah, that makes sense. So. Uh... How did it go with the uh, uh, the uh, packaging change? That's actually one of the of the points we had to share on uh, on next. Let me probably share the screen. <laughs> uh, so here, yeah. um, this is on the part of the, of the things that are, came up on the um, let's say on the on the community, and the packaging change has three main issues that happen. So one is that. Uh, we were sharing some information previous to, to the change, so we even created a blog post, uh, published discussions on, on GitHub to, to try to point users when they were using native packages, how they would need to deal with it when the, the, the change happened. So that was one cause. Uh, we had to point users to, to this uh, several times. The other two were related with some caching problem uh, because of the repository of metadata. And the TPL was too long for some of the metadata files, and this was providing some wrong files to, to the users. And there was another issue about the origin server for the repos that was in causing invalid packages to be in the cache. And this, I think, last change that was done was today. Hopefully, these last two things have been sorted out, but it was a kind of a multiple issue thing that, that happened here with the, the package split. Yeah, because, I mean, I won't say I hate to say it because I do kind of like to say it sometimes, but I mean, I raised the package split issue multiple times over months that it was going to be an, an issue because it wasn't communicated very well and it wasn't at all obvious how you could find out whether you're affected. Um, even the article, you know, the blog post, I've already posted um, a few days ago you know, about how um, it doesn't include all of the plugins that have now been split out. I know, because I, I, I went to install, uh, upgraded, and then it, then it ruined everything. I went to do an apt upgrade, and it, off, uh, it talked about all these suggested ones. I made a list of them, and it was missing at least one of them from the documentation, you know. And I don't know. I mean, hopefully this you won't have to do it again, and so it's just a, it's just a done deal. But uh, it feels like a a lot of work to be doing, just you know, and and it has broken stuff. Like I was I was trying to look at my dashboard, um, uh, to give you an example of the kind of you know the thing I failed to explain earlier. But I've got a load of dashboards with no data at the moment, so I couldn't really explain it. So it's even though I've in, I think I've installed it all of. I used Ansible, so I've deployed that to all the nodes. There's clearly still something wrong. So I guess after this call, I'll look into that. Um, That's interesting. Can you, can, uh, we should help with that. So if there is a bug somewhere, we should solve it. Or if there is a misconfiguration, we have to, we have to ident identify it and fix it for users. Can you help us? Can you share a few screens of what you see or something? Well, I d let's see. I, don't, yeah, I think I could share my screen. Uh... Sorry, I don't use Discord very much. Uh, screen. The hell, why have I got so many options? Whatever, In go live. Discord, Discord is... Discord. If you see break dancing camels, it's got nothing to do with me. Okay. Um, can you see my screen now? Yep. Uh, what have I got? I've got... Some empty stuff down here. I mean, I haven't looked into it yet, so it could just be a pebcac. But um, I was pretty sure, and I am getting other data. So I've got my HTTP checks working. This is just a little dashboard I created to keep uh, track of a couple of my WordPress instances. Um, So the, there are the packet loss says no data. Yeah. So obviously there are no data there. Uh, 
Can you go to the Nigeria dashboard? Is this chart there? Probably we change the collector or something. We broke something probably. To the uh, overview. If you go to the overview, is it there? Um, doesn't look like it should be under the ping. Am I not seeing ping? I'm not seeing it. Hmm. That's interesting. I'm not filtering by mistake, am I? Or doing something stupid? No, no. Uh, okay, so is this. Oh, it's not there. I mean, that must mean it's not returning any data. It's only showing here because it's statically pinned, so to speak, whereas here it just won't show if it's not collected any data. I need to look at the. Mm. So I don't know if we change something on the collector and something is, uh, has changed, but uh, guys, Hugo, can you, can you please try to figure out this, the, the log of the history of the check? Probably we changed something and we broke it. I'll try to, to check this one specific, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll come back to you because, I mean, maybe I did something really dumb. Who knows? It does happen. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's strange because uh, I haven't changed. I don't think I've changed anything there. As I said, everything's in Ansible. I don't believe I've made any changes to that collector. Um, uh, let me have a quick look. Um, let me do that again. Uh, is this me? No, we don't want that. We want... Uh, But probably, Lewis, if you if you want, we can follow up this offline. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to waste your time. I'm sorry. No, it was not to, to put pressure on you to try to find something at the moment. No, I just I don't rem I don't remember changing the thing. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, it's cool. Yeah. Thanks for for raising it. You know, it's definitely yeah. definitely worth looking into because the, if there has been a few users, um, but I think mostly most of it's been fixed. But there could still be one or two other things. So it's it's definitely worth looking at. I think. Yeah. And it just goes to show, like, you you know, try and do the right thing. Like, the whole idea of all this was to try and do the right thing. So <laughs> it's typical that, it, you know, <laughs> there's always something. Yeah, and, but and yeah, like I, I say, hopefully that's really And can I be know. clear that when I give feedback, although it may sometimes be negative, I never mean it negatively. I, I give feedback because I like the product and the team, and I want to see it better. So just... You know, always keep that in mind. All right. I, 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 although it might be negative, I think you guys are doing a great job. I really do. I love this product. It's the dog's behind parts. Awesome. Thanks, thanks for that. Thanks, thanks for thanks and... for for being brave to share your screen there. That was uh, that's the first. <laughs> so you get officially the first person to first user to share their screen on the in the office hours. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and keep the feedback coming. That's definitely helpful. Yeah. So, Probably just conscious of time, we are a bit over over the time. The last thing we were sharing, just kind of a, pointing to some issues that came up on the community. The first one, of course, was the packaging thing. Then there was, I'll just quickly go through them for you to to have if, to see if this relates to something you might need to know. So you, some user was asking about how to confirm if the notifications from cloud will be sent. How can you confirm if everything is set up correctly? So having the email enabled on their space, and making sure the user notification settings for the email are enabled on that space and then the room. So that's kind of a, the, the two things uh, that you need to look at. About Docker monitoring uh, in version 139 and some configuration steps, how to make sure they could see the Docker containers under the VMs and container sections. So there's on, on any chart under the containers and VM sections, you can group and see the, the um, let's say the C groups, the instances that are there. And you can see the, the, the containers that are, are being collected and displayed on that chart. And there's also one point about having the container name resolution instead of showing the IDs of the containers to, to properly get the names out of that. So it's also part of the, of the configuration you can do when you're setting up net data to monitor Docker. Um, let me just quickly go to the next one. So another one was about an option to notify on high anomaly rates. So this is what Andy was was showing about the alert-based anomaly rate uh, configurations of alerts. And there's some examples that were shared for that. Uh, 
other point was about the streaming between parent and child. So uh, in this specific case, there was some missing uh, configuration on the on the parent config. So some samples were provided and help to the user was given to try to make sure the, the configurations were correct. Uh, and there was another one about the Docker images for RM. So uh, there was some change on some time past that we stopped having that as part of the name convention. And there's already an option included on the, um, on the Docker Hub that you can select which OS and architecture you want to, to get the image from. So it's no longer part of the name of the image. It's just an option that you need to choose from from Docker, basically. Uh, and I think that yeah, that was the, the last thing. So stop sharing. So we we are kind of wrapping up. I'm not sure if anybody else has any other question, any other uh, thing they would like to share. Uh, would there be any, uh, this might be a stupid question, uh, another one. Would there be, because right now you've got um, the local API that you can query and poke on the agent, right? And, um, but that's also tied to the dashboard, as far as I understand it. So is that, is my understanding correct that if I disable the dashboard, I disable access, that access to the API? I think there's a specific setting that you that you disable the dashboard, but not the API. And okay, I'll, I'll sure. have a look for that. I think they're not the same. Yeah. Is there any value from a sort of performance or memory overhead? Because otherwise, I just won't bother. I'm not sure, Costa. Do you know about this? The disabling of the of the UI on the agent is it uh, saving any kind of overhead? Disable the UI on the agent. Uh, no, guys, that's a security-only precaution. There is nothing else. If you don't use it, it's the same as it is disabled. So nothing is, uh, there is no memory there used by that if you um, uh, disable it. So that we don't save anything. It's the code is inside in the data. I, I think that if you plan to disable it, it's better to bind it to a low, to localhost only. So don't disable it, mainly because sometimes you need to, down, to download the data conf or you need a script to actually query something from the data. So I think that it, it is helpful to be there, but you can bind it to localhost so that it will not be available to anyone else, only from localhost. That's perfect. Thank you. And you will also support access lists if you want, for example, to, to restrict it to certain IPs or the likes. So all these configurations are possible. To say, for example, that only your computer or the, the, a bunch of computers will have access to the APIs. Yeah, because um, I've been thinking about the sort of the maintenance mode thing, and I was playing with, I haven't done it yet, but I was playing with the idea of using Ansible to query the file that contains the API key for the agent, and then mm. for each agent, it does the same thing, and it will poke the API on that agent to go, be quiet, we're about to break stuff. Keep in mind that uh, there is a request from users to actually uh, use the API to collect also metrics. So they want their applications, for example, to do HTTP POST requests to NetData, to update metrics. Uh, so generally, the API, uh, I, I think, should be available, but uh, I think it should be restricted to. We also plan to, at, at some point, so in the next agent release, the dashboard will be changed, the agent dashboard will be changed, and we will ship the, the cloud dashboard with the agent. So the UI of the agent, of the single node dashboard, it's going to be the same, exactly the same with the cloud. Oh, nice. uh, so all the functionalities and everything there. Um, the one thing that we are examining is actually to add a security layer there so that people can access, access the agent directly only if they are logged in cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that uh, the API will be open, but protected. If you don't come from a cookie from the cloud, sorry, you can't access right. it. Nice. I really like that. Yeah, because your docs are like, yeah, bring your own, which is very Linuxy and open sourcey, but it does require a little bit of work. But yeah, that's no, brilliant. Thank you. The, the key sure. problem with this stuff, this change is, is mainly how to explain this to people that they have a past with the data and something changes and suddenly something doesn't work. Like the things I, th I think the problem you're facing with the uh, 
with the HTTP check collector is that uh, we changed the packaging and now the GoD plugin is in a different package. So I don't know if you install that package too. I will figure it out immediately after this call. I will go, I will have a meeting to, to figure out if there is an issue there. Uh, um, but uh, probably it's also our fault. So we did something wrong there. Well, don't worry, I'll have a look. And thanks, you guys, so much time. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> There's a cat. <laughs> I was, I was trying to answer also Zydek Z Z Z uh, asked uh, about vCenter server monitoring. We, we have a collector for that, so I'm not really sure um, what you're looking for, but uh, we have already some... some, uh, some uh... If you want, I, I posted the link on, on the chat, and if you want to take a look, take a look, and we can, of course, follow up on it if you see. Uh... Just then, final check. Uh, are we good to wrap up and see you in two weeks' time? Yeah. Like it. And thanks for for all the all the um, all the chat and all the feedback. And let's keep it happening. Yeah. Have a good one, guys. Thank awesome. you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.